Hello artists and welcome to the Epic Journey. For those of you who've never seen the Epic Journey video before, my name is Deline Fouché McIntosh. I'm commonly referred to as Deline FM because I've got a name like this. I am an art teacher and I teach most mediums. I tend to stay away from watercolor, but otherwise I teach pretty much everything else. My specialities include particularly portraiture and of course I'm an enormous horse lover so I do a lot of horse art. Well, today, related to those two subjects, we're going to be talking about eyes. You know, I tend to make these videos revolved around things that come up in the in-studio lessons. And in our in-studio lessons lately, we've been doing a lot of eyes, a lot of animals and a lot of people. So today I thought we'd talk about eyes. I'm going to take you through the structure of an eye and how one can create a really good sparkling looking eye. But before we go into the actual drawing of the eye, I want to talk to you about the structure of the eye. Okay, now... If you refer to the camera overhead footage, what you're going to see here is I've got a polystyrene ball that I've covered in clink film because I wanted to make it shiny rather than paint it. I just covered it in, in clink film. I've just taped it at the back. Now, the ball is completely spherical, unlike a human eye or an animal eye. The eye ball itself is spherical, absolutely. It's a, it's a pure sphere. But then we've got corneas and all sorts. So we'll get to that later. But let's just look at the sphere to start off with. Now, the, the ball shape, the sphere shape, is the one shape in nature that is not subject to foreshortening. You know, if you have something, if you have something disc shape as you turn it, so it's going to show differences in perspective. However, when you've got a ball shape as you turn it, it still remains, it doesn't matter which way you turn this, it is still going to be a ball. So when we're drawing or painting eyes, we've got to realize that it's not the ball itself that changes shape. It's the flesh around the ball that changes shape. So the, the flesh that will obviously be in whatever, depending if you're painting a human or an animal eye, the flesh that is around that, that, expo that is open and that exposes the eye to you, that is what's going to change shape as the ball moves in terms of our perspective. But today we're not going to be talking about the outer eye as such. We're talking just about the eyeball itself because what we're trying to get to is a point where, we, where I can show you how to make that eye look really, really alive when you're painting and drawing. You know, you get a lot of people that comment about how artists uh, draw and paint such beautifully alive eyes. We need to know what it is that that artist knows that we don't know that is making that eye so incredibly lifelike. So that's what the aim is today. It's to have a look at this eye, understand it because you know, if you guys follow me on the epic journey, you'll know I say it so many times. You've got to know what you're talking about when you draw. You've got to know your subject. And if if you're just painting or drawing something from a source material that you are not intimately involved with, you're literally just kind of documenting what you're seeing. But a real good understanding of what you're looking at is going to help you to be able to add your artistic creative flair to it to really take your art to that next level and make that eye look superbly brilliant. All right, so when we have a look, like I said, at the eyeball, the eyeball itself is completely spherical. But let's have a look at this one here. What I've done is I've taken, I've just taken a hot knife and I've just sliced off a little bit of the ball. So if you look at it from the side, it's got a bit of a flat edge. So now we're just talking about eyes in general, not specifically human or animals. This will apply to most animals. There's some one or two animals and the horse is one of them and we'll come to that where this is not quite as applicable, but it's particularly applicable to humans. If you take your your round sphere and you just slice off a little bit, turn it to the side, we'll see the one side is slightly flat, flat. That will be representative of the iris because the iris is a muscle that sits and opens and closes to let light in and it's disc shaped, so it's completely flat. That is not where it ends. We've actually then got a kind of, uh, call it for want of a better word, a bit of a bubble over that. That is the cornea that protects that eye from dust and rubbish getting in there. And that cornea is slightly raised. So to represent that, I've got another slightly smaller piece that I've actually sliced off a smaller polystyrene ball. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a clear one. I was hoping to get clear because the cornea is clear. But if we place that on top of the iris, then what we're going to see... So let's put a thingy in there so it'll stay still for me. Okay. So if we place that on top of the iris... This, of course, will be clear, so you'll see the color of the iris, but you've got an extra bubble. So you've got a round ball, if you look at it in the camera from the side, you've got a round ball with an extra bubble coming off the side of it. Now, that is hugely important to understand because that is going to make a lot of difference to how your shadows and your lights fall. Now, I have been teaching for many, many years, and I have so often said to people, your shadows fall on the iris, the highlights fall on the cornea. 
and they look at me strange and frankly I look at myself strange too because first of all you've got to know what the, sh what the iris and the cornea is. You've got to understand that the iris is flat and the cornea is dome shape. That would be representative of the cornea and the slice that I took off the eyeball would be representative of the iris itself. So when you think, okay, now why is it that shadows fall on the flat part and highlights fall on the round part? Well, strictly speaking, that's not really true. Of course, shadows and highlights are going to fall on both parts. But what we're going to notice is that the highlights that fall on the cornea, that's the raised bit, are going to be far, far, far more obvious than the highlights that, are, that fall on the flat part. We're also going to notice that shadows that fall on the cornea are going to be a lot less obvious than shadows that fall on the flat part, which is the iris. Now, what is the reason for that? I'll go a little bit off the beaten track now. Have you ever looked into a shop window or into a house window and you can't quite see through because the sunlight is catching on that window and it's causing a glare? So the window is not terribly transparent because of this direct light that's shining on it. And But if you go up to it and you cover your hands and you create a little pocket of shadow, you can see quite clearly into the window. That's what's happening here. Of course, you're creating a shadow on the window, and what's happening because that you've created that shadow on the window is that you're now able to see straight through it because the light is not bouncing back from the highlight straight into your eyes. You've cancelled out that light. So that is a shadow, but you don't really see the shadow on the window. You might see it lying, you might see it falling onto the floor inside, you know, the building that you're looking into. So that would be, let's say, a representative of the iris. But the highlight, when you're looking at the window without a shadow on it, the highlight is bouncing back at you, so you can't see past it. So you can't see what is behind that. And, and even if you can, it's sort of a bit clouded. You can't really see it terribly clearly. So when I refer to highlights falling on the cornea and shadows falling on the iris, that's the kind of relationship between light and dark that I'm talking about. It's not strictly true, but it's how our, our, our brains interpret what we're looking at. Okay. So I hope that kind of describes you a little bit of how my mind works in terms of understanding how highlights and shadows work on, on the iris and the eyeball itself. So here we've got three surfaces. We've got the large sphere, we've got the flat surface of the iris, and we've got the smallest dome of the uh, cornea itself. Now if you have a look at the cornea, I've tried to do it as accurately as possible, but the cornea is not a half a circle. It's not a, a half a sphere. It would stick out a lot more off the eye than it would if it was. This is actually more like, say, maybe a quarter. Um, and and the entire circumference of this cornea was, was a complete ball. It would be a lot smaller than the ball of the eyeball itself. It's much smaller in circumference if it was an entire circle. So what that does is that it creates a slight difference in how the shadows and lights fall. Now, of course, the lighting here in my studio is designed for art, so it's not necessarily going to work very well, so we'll show it in drawing. But if you have a look, I'm hoping the camera picks this up, but the way that I'm looking at it here, I'm seeing a, a, a darker bit around the outside of the cornea here, and I'm seeing a darker bit around the outside of the eyeball as well, because the, the angle of the curves are changing as the contours, should we say, the cross contours of these curves are changing as we go down. I'm also seeing a highlight there and I'm seeing little bits of highlights on either side and I'm seeing quite a lot of highlight here and then I'm seeing quite a lot of mid-tones all the way around here and up here. So the highlights on the cornea and the shadows on the cornea are being interrupted by the shape, okay, by the change of the, the curvature of these two surfaces. Now if we just go back to the iris for a minute, we're going to see, now let's just compare the two next to one another. We're going to see, that would be the iris, we're going to see how the highlights, let me just move it around a little bit so you guys might see how it works. The highlights are different. It doesn't catch the, the, the light in the same way because that's a flat surface. So the highlights here are going to be far more general. So they're not nearly as obvious to us as what the highlights are be on, on the cornea because they're concentrated. Okay, so that's a whole lot of technicalities. I'm not going to go into too much more about the detail or about the anatomy of the eye. But, you know, when artists talk about knowing anatomy and how it helps, this is the kind of thing they're talking about. To understand the anatomy of the object that you're drawing really, really helps you to understand how and why shadows and highlights fall where they do or why structures fall where they do. And it can really help you to improve, in this case, it can help you to improve the glint in the eye, it can help you to make a more realistic looking eye, that they really look like they're burning into your soul. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put this aside, and I'm going to do a couple of drawings of eyes here, um, off camera, and then I'll come back to it um, to finish them off, because what I want to show you here is how to make a dead looking eye look really, really alive. 
So let me get drawing and I'll be back with you in a mo. All right, so here we've got a human eye and a horse's eye. I've specifically chosen reference material that really didn't give a lot of highlight in the eye, so there was not a lot of life in these eyes. And these are very quick sketches. I think they took me maybe 10 minutes each. So they really, you know, they're on fancy sketches. So please forgive me for that. But what we're going to do now is we're going to try and put some life into these eyes. Now, what you've got to understand about a horse's eye is that the cornea part, the part that protrudes off of the eyeball is much bigger in relationship to the eyeball itself as what a human eye. You see, we see a lot more of the white in the human eye than what we do on the horse's eye. The horse's eye is, the, the cornea is so big that Unless they're really looking close ahead of them, um, you can see a little bit of white at the back of the eye in that case. Or if they're frightened and they're looking behind them or their eyes are wide with fear, then you can see some of the white. But other than that, you really don't see a lot of the white of the eye. So the life of this eye has got to come into the cornea only. So let's leave the horse's eye for a moment. Let's have a look at the, the uh, human eye. Because there's a couple of things that we can do here. Because that, that's looking pretty flat. We, we don't really see any shape to that cornea. So in the reference material, we had a little bit of a highlight there. Okay. That's all. It was pretty much all there was. But I want to give this eye some sort of shape. Now, I know from my model that we've got a difference in the light and a, and a change of the curvature here so I can exploit that to make my eye look a little bit more exciting uh, the directionality of the light in this particular case is coming from the top but not really all that strong so whatever the light is that I want to create in here it's going to have to be at the top that's another thing you've got to make sure that your highlights make sense in terms of your light direction okay so now I'm going to start putting a little bit of highlight underneath the eyelashes. This part here, that's the shadow. You see me. This part here is the shadow that the eyelashes are casting onto the eye. So it, that's not going to have any light in it because it's effectively in shadow. But I can start putting in a little bit of what I can assume will be light that is reflected down through or below the eyelashes. Now because we know that the cornea is round we can actually widen it to that point there okay and we can add a little bit of a highlight there because we know that the cornea's shape is going to catch light a little bit all right and we can do it a little bit down the side as well because we've got this dome shape that's falling down so the light is going to go down and down but it's going to change direction at that point this way so we can add a little bit more light going down. Now straight away we're starting to see that our cornea is starting to take a little bit more shape. We know that that's the strongest highlight because on the source material that's where it was. But let's soften that a little bit and bring it up into this light here. And then we can also intensify it. Now the danger with putting too much highlight in your eyes is that you end up looking a little bit like there's multiple light sources and your eye lights up like a Christmas tree and then it's not really all that real. So be careful not to fall into the trap of over highlighting your eye. But you must always have some really, really nice strong highlights in your eye to really describe it. But now what we can do also is we can take this highlight and we can bring it onto the, now I've, I've worked on grey paper on purpose so that the, the chalk shows up quite nicely, but we can take some of that highlight and it will be a softer curve because we know that the eyeball is bigger than the cornea in terms of the curvature. Now we've got this curve coming down and we want to slightly change the directionality of the curve or the, the, the circumference of the curve because we know that the eyeball is, is bigger than the iris, uh, sorry, than the cornea. So we've added a little bit of highlights there. Another thing that we can do is we know that the eye is quite moist and there's often a collection of moisture at the bottom here. So we can just add a few little highlights right up against the lower eyelid here to denote some of the moisture. Now if you add too much of this it's going to look like your your subject is crying so don't overemphasize this but you can add a little and then some here in the shadows as well where we can suggest a little bit of reflected light. 
coming into the highlight that's on the eyeball itself. And then, of course, what often happens is that this little fleshy bit in the corner of the eye also catches a little bit of light. So we can also just go and add a few little touches of highlights in there. And immediately we've got a far more interesting eye. Now, I would fix this now and really go and highlight that a bit. Okay, it's, it's not fixed, it's coming out quite grey, but, but I would, in fact, go and get a really, really strong highlight and I'll come back and do that. But let's move over to the horse's eye now for a minute. The horse's eye is quite an interesting one because, number one, we've got a far bigger cornea. Number two, there's a lot less light on this horse's eye than what in the original source material was and what was even on the, the human eye. Now, 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 just to go back to the human eye, all that there was not on the reference work. I've put that in to bring out the highlight in the eye. And, of course, there's so much else that you can do to it. But if you overwork it, you're going to look like your eye is a bit Christmas tree-ish. Okay? So be careful with overworking it. The horse's eye, we've actually got a little bit more scope with it. Because in the original uh, source material that I've got in front of me here, there's a little bit of a highlight kind of there. All right. So we know... I haven't drawn it in very strongly because I want to work with that. But uh, we've got a light source that's pretty much coming from this direction, I would say. Um, it's pretty general. There's not a lot uh, to go on to be able to say. But there's a couple of things about this eye that gives me some clues. For example, I've got the slightly lighter area in here. Now, this is pretty much where the cornea and the white of the eye are meeting, although I'm not really seeing white of the eye at this stage. But I'm starting to see the designation between cornea and white of the eye. Now, we know that those areas pick up light a lot. So I can actually start putting in some highlights there on that little designated area. Because I can also see on my source material that I've got this lighter part at the bottom which is reflected light coming from below the horse. And I, I can exploit that. Let's really lighten that a little. Now, that is our natural light source that is, you know, on the source photograph that I'm working from. So we know that, that is there, so let's put that in. But let's expand on that and really start giving that eye some curvature. Another thing that I can see is that we've got the inside of the eyeball here and that I can also exploit because we know that that will catch a bit of light if our light was a little bit stronger. Oh dear, what's happened to my chalk? So we can give that a little bit of a line and that will pick up the inside corner of the horse's eye quite nicely. We can do the same thing at the bottom here. We've already got a slightly lighter bit, so we can exaggerate that a little bit. And then, of course, we've got the highlights, which is in the source material on the fleshy bit of the horse's eye. So let's put those in. I'm just doing this, you know, really quite quickly. Alright, so I've got a white chalk pastel here, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to really dig deep into those white areas.
And now on the human eye, we'll do a similar thing. We'll dig deep into the very whitest of the highlighters, the very whitest of the highlight areas, and really get this this eye sparkling. And folks, that's pretty much how you really make an eye come alive. It's the highlights that really make the difference. But you've also got to understand that they are relative to the shadowed areas. And simply put, very, very simply put, please, it's just, it's just a rule of thumb. It's really not cast in stone. Shadows fall flat onto the iris and highlights show the curvature of the cornea. And the highlights will give it moisture. The highlights will give it dimension. And suddenly your, your eye just starts to pop and people will look at your artwork and go wow your eyes are so beautiful and it's a real it really is a relatively simple simple understanding so artists i hope you've enjoyed this tutorial on the eye and i hope what it's done is to make you understand how incredibly important it is to know your subject that you're drawing it's really, really a good idea for us that are completely horsey mad and want to draw a lot of horses. It's a good idea to actually spend time with horses and gaze. And, you know, I used to sit and gaze into my horse's eyes. And I'm, I think he thought I was just gazing lovingly. But what I was actually doing, <laughs> besides gazing lovingly, um, was studying the structure of the eye. And a lot of what I draw of the horse's eye uh, comes from what I've seen in real life in my own horse's eyes. So it's a really a good idea. You know, the... There's all sorts of other things. You can run your hands over the bones of the face. So, you know, these, these cheekbones that are so nice and sharp. You run your hands over it and you feel the sharpness of the cheekbones. And it's amazing how that, that experience with the subject that you're drawing is actually going to make you a better artist because you're understanding it from a, a more than a purely academic point of view. So if, if, if nothing else... I hope that this tutorial has got that message through. Know your subject intimately. And from now onwards, you can be one of those that paints really, really bright eyes now that you understand the structure of the eye. Thank you so much for joining me, people. I hope that you've enjoyed this tutorial. Um, as you know, the, the Epic Journey videos are no longer numbered. There was going to be 365 videos, but of course now we're just carrying through, so there's no need to number them anymore. The Epic Journey is not going to come to an end. If you're seeing this video on a site other than the Epic Journey or on a page or a group other than the Epic Journey, please will you go ahead and uh, look for Epic Art Academy or Epic Art is the name of the Facebook group and give it a like. Um, I'll include the link in the video here below and there will be more of these videos. They're pretty much daily, but um, of late they've been a lot, um, a lot less frequent, particularly over the Christmas and New Year season and before that I was building an art website. So, um, but from now, this is the first of the 2017 uh, tutorials, and we're going to see a lot more of them in 2017. So, thank you so much for joining me. Please pop on over to epicartacademy.com and go and have a look and see what's available there, or you can just go to Epic Art on Facebook page and give us a like. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye.